We're happy to have you, Father Dom. Um, Father Dom, he is, uh, you know, past, uh, he had a wonderful program on uh, PBS uh, several years ago. He's written six books. Uh, he has a, an amazing website. Uh, it just, just, I don't know. Uh, we're, we're just happy to have you. And he's going to tell us what to do for holiday baking. So okay. welcome, welcome. Thank you. It's good to see you. Um, just some, uh, as people are still signing in, so everybody knows, um, while, while I'm giving my presentation, people are welcome to put questions into the chat. Uh, so if you look down at the bottom, you can click on chat and, and put a question there. Uh, and then uh, we'll keep an eye on those. Oh, this is just... And, uh, uh, people well, can I'd love to try. I know I don't... God. I hear someone else who's... Okay, there we go. <laughs> Somebody else so who needed just... you yeah, you'll just have to catch them. Um, so if you yeah, want to okay. in the middle of things, please feel free. Okay. I'm going to go okay. to uh, share screen. And uh, when I do that, you'll be able to see the PowerPoint as I make comments on it. Uh, I will not be able to see any of you, obviously. Uh, but as I said, put your questions in with chat. Okay. So we're going to go to share screen and take a look. Oh, hello, Armand de Bach. How are you? Uh, <laughs> let's go here. Okay, here we go. So, uh, I'm going to reduce this so it's out of my way as well. Okay. So, um, this is called Bake Your Way Through the Holidays. Um, this is, uh, this picture you're seeing here is from a, a, a Christmas special I did some years ago uh, in which I uh, baked all those things and, and uh, uh, that Christmas special is no longer available. But that is pretty much what my kitchen looks like during the holiday season because I'm baking nonstop. Uh, I've been baking all week already. I'll usually on any given holiday, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter, uh, I might make as many as 15 or 20 dozen dinner rolls and you know, give them out to friends and uh, occasionally sell them, but more likely that it's, uh, if, you're, if you're a friend of mine, chances are you're going to get some. I did a thing just recently. It was so nice. I made some dinner rolls for somebody at Thanksgiving, and uh, I said, come to the back door of the monastery, because we're still under kind of a COVID quarantine. I said, come to the back door. I'll stand on the loading dock. We can mask up. I will hand you dinner rolls, and then uh, uh, just so you can take them for Thanksgiving. And I handed him dinner rolls and he handed me a donation to help uh, needy families uh, for the holidays. So uh, just that kind of sharing, uh, sharing just always brings about even greater sharing. So one of the ways I wanna get people to bake their way through the holidays is because it's just what we need in this season. It's exactly what we need in this season is to be sharing with one another and inspiring generosity. Now, those of you who saw me just a little bit ago might be wondering why I don't look like this, which is my usual look, but instead look like this. And that's because within a few days, I'm going to look like this because I am playing Santa for a couple of videos. Uh, we had this item on our auction in which I would create a video, uh, personalized video message for uh, children uh, or grandchildren. And, uh, and so I'm setting up a little scene, uh, a little mini studio, and then I'm gonna, whiten my beard a little bit and then uh, put on my Father Christmas outfit and, uh, and tape a video for him. Oh, you can turn off the TV. So I want to go through uh, a variety of recipes that have to do with the holidays and I want to start with Hanukkah because uh, I keep hearing a lot of talking in the background. Has somebody got a mic on? I keep hearing a lot of talking in the background. Has somebody got a mic on? I keep seeing people with, uh, I keep seeing, I keep getting lots of background noise, uh, just people talking. That's better. Okay. Um, so I want to start with Hanukkah because we're in Hanukkah right now. Hanukkah started last week and it uh, is an eight day festival. And I want to talk a little bit about what Hanukkah is and why it's celebrated for those of you who may not know, and then talk about what you make in order to celebrate it. And one of those things is Hanukkah jelly donuts. So Hanukkah is called the festival of lights. It goes for eight nights, and it celebrates the rededication of the temple after it had been recaptured from an invading army. So Antiochus IV uh, was a, a king who uh, took over uh, the Holy Land, uh, the land of Israel, 
and forced them to take on pagan practices, including putting a statue of Zeus in the temple of Jerusalem, which is a great abomination. And so uh, he was trying to force pagan practices on the Jews and have them give up uh, kosher foods and, and circumcision, other things like that. Now, Judas Maccabeus was uh, a, a leading citizen there, and he and his sons revolted against Antiochus and successfully uh, got together this guerrilla army that drove out the uh, invading army. So after they did that, they rededicated the temple, they lit the seven-branch lampstand, and they resumed worship in uh, the temple itself. Okay. However, it was a time of war, and there was a shortage of oil for the lamps. It wasn't candles then. It was oil for oil lamps. And they only had enough for a single night. But miraculously, because of the Lord's favor for them having uh, rededicated the temple, the lamps burned for eight nights instead of one. And so that's why Hanukkah is an eight-night festival. So the lighting of the menorah is the primary ritual associated with Hanukkah. And as you can see, it has eight candles for the eight nights. And then the center candle is the one with which you light all the others. That's called the helper candle. But that's why the uh, lighting of the menorah is the primary symbol of Hanukkah is because of remembering the lampstand in the temple at its rededication. This is also the holiday where they play the dreidel game with the little gold coins that are filled with chocolate. They're called gelt. Uh, I play the dreidel game with my students every year when we study Hanukkah in world religions, and we usually play with uh, M&Ms or Skittles. Uh, but it is a popular game with them, too. Uh, one of the things that's very common in Hanukkah is foods fried in oil. And the two that are most common are latkes, which is like a potato cake that's made with shredded potato and sometimes with some egg, usually with scallions or some other kind of onion flavored thing. Uh, and the other thing are these sufganyot, uh, which are Hanukkah jelly donuts. So that's the bread that we're going to talk about. And I'll do a little tutorial here. Okay. Now there's one piece of kitchen equipment you must have in order to make Hanukkah jelly donuts and one piece of kitchen equipment that makes things easier. So the first thing you must have, of course, is a fryer. Now what you see right here is a commercial fryer like they have in, this is actually in Jerusalem, uh, where they're frying the sukkunyot for, uh, for the holiday. And, uh, but you don't need anything as fancy as that. You really don't. Uh, you can do it in a heavy stock pot on the stove top. Uh, you can do it on one of these enameled uh, Dutch ovens. Uh, you can also make use of a deep uh, cast iron skillet. You've got to be able to put at least two inches of oil in it without it uh, being in danger of boiling over. Those ones that are a little thicker, like for a roaster, those are great. I'm a little taller. Uh, those, are, those are great for those purpose. If you use these stovetop things, whether it's gas or electric, I really recommend that you get yourself a um, candy thermometer so that you can keep the temperature of the oil constant. We'll talk about that temperature in a little bit. Uh, but you can certainly do this in a fryer, just like an ordinary, like a fry daddy, or you can use one of these lower kinds of uh, electric fryers. Uh, Presto makes one, and well, lots of other brands make them. Because what's nice about them is that they have a thermostat dial on them, and you can turn them to get the um, temperature of the oil consistent. It'll stay constant without you having to adjust it at all. Uh, however, some of them, you might want to check one before you buy it. The dial on it is not um, by temperature. The dial is by number. And so you'll have to experiment a little bit with your thermometer to figure out what dial number is appropriate. The model that I have is four and a half. <laughs> so you might consider setting it at four and a half first, put your thermometer in and see what happens. But this works really well. I love the electric ones really good because they're low. You're not reaching over into a deeper thing, which it feels a little dangerous, like you're going to burn an arm or something. I really like this particular uh, solution to having your fryer. The one piece of kitchen equipment you will want to have is something to put the filling in the donuts. Now that could be as simple as a squirt bottle with a narrow tip like this, or you can use a pastry bag with one of these narrower tips. That's the kind that is used for filling uh, cupcakes, but it works perfect for making sufganyot as well. 
this is the kind that they uh, the commercial kind that actually are designed to fill jelly donuts and bismarcks and the like a little harder to find not absolutely necessary this was available at walmart this is what i bought this was available at walmart and it comes with two disposable plastic pastry bags as well so if you're just going to start seeing ah, let's see if i like this i don't want to buy a pastry, an expensive pastry bag the reusable kind uh, maybe you do want to keep that but uh, uh, this is a way to kind of get your, your entrance into it. However, that whole squirt bottle thing works great because that's what I made, uh, that's what I used the, the first time I made these and that's what I have the photos of. Now, um, I'm gonna, at the end of this program, I'm going to be sending to the library uh, a document which will have links to all the recipes. So you don't need to take notes on any of this because all the recipes and the descriptions of the um, various steps are all going to be on this uh, document. There will be links to uh, a variety of websites. One of them is going to be Tori Avey's uh, uh, website. She's a Jewish baker. She's a Jewish housewife, but just an excellent, excellent baker. And uh, she makes amazing traditional Jewish breads and foods in general. And her version of Sifkanyot just cannot be improved upon. I, I just, I, it works beautifully. So that's really the recipe I want to send you to. One of the things that if you're used to making dough, you know how you make dough and it kind of pulls away from the sides and it starts to get a little smoother and kind of glossy on the sides. That's not gonna happen with the dough for sufganyon. It's quite soft, as you can see on the left-hand side. It's very soft dough, very liquid. And so it's not gonna pull away from the sides in the same way. So if you, if you find, you think, oh, I need more flour. No, you don't. It really is supposed to be that soft. Another thing that I want to point out to you, and that's why I put the picture of the cookie cutter there. You're going to use a biscuit cutter. I think the two and a half inch biscuit cutter is the perfect size. Any larger than that? I mean, three inch is usually a normal size for a donut at your average donut shop in the United States. I think those are a little big. These, if you do two and a half or even two inch, uh, and they make a two inch biscuit cutter, um, it feels more like a little treat and you don't feel bad afterwards after you've eaten it. I mean, I find, you know, you buy a Danish in Denmark and it's this little tiny thing and you don't feel bad about eating two of them. You buy a Danish in the United States, it's the size of a catcher's mitt. You know, afterwards you feel like you go to get, have to go to confession for having eaten it. So I like this, you know, using a smaller um, a cutter, two and a half uh, is kind of the maximum size. And as you push down, with the cutter, I think it's best to give a little twist. Now, I don't recommend that for biscuits. With biscuits, you don't want to twist because then you could seal the sides and then they won't flake up like you want them to. But with these jelly donuts, you kind of want to seal the sides a little bit so they turn into this poofy round bomb, you know? Uh, and, and you'll see that in, in the pictures themselves, okay? But as you push down, you can give it a little twist with this dough. It's especially, it's almost necessary because it's so slack, because it's so soft. Uh, now, as I said, um, uh, Tori Avey uh, has done extensive experimentation on this recipe. A lot of recipes will tell you, fry these at 350. Some of them will even say 375. She has found, and I can confirm, that at that temperature, sometimes your outside of your dough will brown and the inside will be uncooked, like you'll be kind of doughy on the inside. She recommends between 325 and 340. And that's what I did mine in, and I think they turned out just great. And so did everybody else who devoured them within minutes of my putting them on the table. So this seems to me to be the perfect uh, temperature. And 90 seconds per side is exactly right. I used a timer, I did exactly 90 seconds per side, and they turned out absolutely gorgeous. They're a beautiful golden brown. Now, one of the things that I wanna point out to you here is you'll look at these striations. I hope you can see the arrow there. You see these striations on the top of the dough. That's because the dough has got a long, slow rise. It's not gonna rise in an hour, and then you punch it down and shape, and then it rises in half an hour. It's gonna take two hours on your first round on your first rise. So don't make these if you're in a hurry. So the first rise is maybe gonna be two hours, second rise might be 45 minutes, but because the top dries out a little bit, it kind of stretches out and gets these marks in it. Nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's kind of good. A slightly dried out top 
means that you're going to get that rounded form that's kind of you know poofy that you can put a lot of filling in okay uh, and you're going to cover that up with powdered sugar anyway so the looks don't matter so you're going to drain these and let them cool at least to lukewarm before you fill them now she suggests tori suggests that you open up the uh a hole with a drinking straw, ordinary plastic drinking straw. And I found that worked pretty well. I tried it without and tried it with, and it does work better. Just don't poke it down so far that you poke a hole through the bottom. Now, it's traditional in Sufganyot to fill from the top. If you were making jelly donuts that are the Pashki kind for the Polish tradition, tradition for uh, Easter, of course, you're going to make those from the side. You're going to fill those from the side. Either one is actually appropriate, but traditionally, sukunyot is made with the filling from the top. That was canceled and it was. Now, canceled. as you can see here, I simply used a squeeze bottle. For the, and there's somebody else still on, not on mute. I keep hearing talking in the background. Um, also, here, uh, what I want to point out to you about this filling here this filling I have used for this particular one, I took strawberry pie filling and ran it through a blender until it was perfectly smooth even chopped up the seeds and that is less sweet than jelly or jam or preserves now tori avi says take your preserves or your jam and run it through a sieve to get all the seeds out for strawberry or raspberry filling but as i said i used pie filling which is a little less sweet and again it doesn't feel quite so cloying doesn't feel quite so so heavy duty. I liked it better. It was a little lighter. And a little powdered sugar on the top makes all the difference. When you fill it up, you squeeze the bottle gently and it starts to come out the top, you know that you've got it full, full enough. Notice here, it's just a little light thing. Uh, you put a little bit of powdered sugar in a sieve like this and sprinkle it over the top. And what happens is it covers over the jelly dot or the jam dot and then eventually the the sugar melts and you have the, the little uh, colored dot on the top. And that is kind of traditional for the appearance of a sukhanyo. Uh I think over here, these that look like they're black raspberry or, or maybe blueberry. Uh, chocolate ones are more popular these days as well. Uh, you'll find chocolate filling, uh, although that's kind of non-traditional. And let's take a look at another one up close. Uh, these are absolutely a, a wonderful, delicious thing. Although they take a long time, they are not in and of themselves particularly difficult. Okay. Anybody with a question about anything that has to do with the sufganyo before we move on to another? Uh, and we'll have time for questions about other kinds of baking later too. So, anything right now that you have on the chat box there? Not that I see. Okay, thank you, Madeline. Uh -huh. Okay, so let's uh, let's move on to the next recipe, uh, and I want to make something for Kwanzaa, which is another holiday that's going to be this month. Uh, in this case, I want to make a fruited sweet potato bread. Now, what I love about this is that it pretty much could go with Thanksgiving, it could be Christmas, it could be Kwanzaa. It wouldn't be too bad to go with Easter, for that matter, since people serve sweet potatoes with ham sometimes. It's just kind of a traditional Southern dish. Uh, but I do like uh, this sweet potato bread, and it's a nice way to use up your leftovers as well. Now, Kwanzaa is a relatively new holiday, but it has ancient origins. A lot of people are unfamiliar with where it comes from, so I do want to talk about that a little bit. In 1966, there was a Black activist named Milana Karenga, and he wanted to unite and empower African Americans, especially after the Watts riots. And so he wanted to create a celebration of their heritage, their kind of common heritage, and the things that their culture valued. And so he took the name of the holiday from this Swahili phrase, Motunda Ya Kwanza, which means first fruits, which is essentially a holiday or a festival of the beginning of the harvest season. Okay. The original text, I mean, the original word Kwanza had a single A in it. And I think this is really very charming that when he this developed the practices for the holiday, there were at the first celebration, seven children present, and he wanted to make sure each of them had a letter assigned to them so they could be part of the ceremony, everybody could be a part of the ceremony. And so that's why there's this additional A 
on the name of the holiday, even though the original uh, Swahili phrase uh, is a single A on the end. But I think that idea of making sure that children are involved in learning their heritage is a really positive thing. Uh, it is a harvest festival, and so you'll very often see the tables decorated with all kinds of different fruits and vegetables and so forth. It's really very colorful tables. If you look up uh, Kwanzaa table and put it in a search engine and look at the images, some of them are just gorgeous, really very beautiful. And like uh, Hanukkah, it has the tradition of lighting candles. It is a cultural holiday rather than a religious feast. Lots of people celebrate both Kwanzaa and Christmas. It's not meant to replace Christmas or substitute for it. It's simply an additional celebration during that season in which the culture uh, of African Americans or as black people in general can be celebrated in addition to the more kind of Western traditions that come along with Christmas. A Kwanzaa centers around seven principles which are represented by the seven candles. So each of the candles represents a different principle which is valued in their in that culture. Uh, unity, self-determination, collective work and responsibility, cooperative economics, purpose, creativity, and faith, which I think are really beautiful values that pretty much every culture should value. And the idea that one celebrates a, a, a holiday in order to try to make that um, you know, the centerpiece uh, of the uh, of the things you discuss and talk about and pray over, I think is a really positive thing. I think it's really very beautiful. Now, because Kwanzaa is in fact a harvest festival of kinds, uh, I have chosen this particular recipe because it uses so many different ingredients. Uh, and that might be a little bit daunting at first. However, uh, this is the sweet potatoes here on the upper left. And I should say, you can use canned just as they are, run them through a blender or, a, or we'll use a, mash, a potato masher or uh, a food processor, whatever. Uh, or you can use the ones that you've cooked yourself and then mashed, or you can use the leftovers from your sweet potato casserole. All of those are gonna work for this recipe. Uh, ordinary all-purpose flour is gonna work fine for this recipe, ordinary granulated sugar. These are chopped walnuts and these are raisins, of course. This is ordinary orange juice. This is uh, salted butter. I think uh, works just fine for this. So you can use unsalted if you're trying to reduce uh, sodium in your diet. This is unsweetened homemade um, applesauce. We just happen to have an apple orchard here at the monastery. And this year I collected quite a few and turned, uh, turned out several batches of applesauce for the brethren. So that's what I used. But you can use the canned variety as well. Uh, this is uh, the spices, which are essentially uh, nutmeg and uh, uh, cinnamon. And you can use clove or some other combination of things. I think this would be really good too with Chinese five spice with that little licorice groove that goes with it. It's got that kind of anise uh, twist on it as well with a little bit of pepper as well. They give it some heat. I think that would be kind of exotic and I, I, I'm gonna try that I think next year. Uh, this is baking powder and some salt and then a couple of eggs. So one of the things that I want to emphasize with people in general is when you are going to whisk your dry ingredients together. So your wet ingredients are on the right with your, uh, your eggs and, and the, the applesauce and the, excuse me, and uh, melted butter and uh, the uh, orange juice. On the left-hand side of the dried ingredients would have been whisked together. Now, a lot of people don't realize that in order to really thoroughly mix the baking powder in with the flour, uh, you need to stir it for a really long time with a good whisk and not a fat one with this kind of thinner one works better. In fact, uh, Shirley Koraher wrote a book called uh, Cookwise, <laughs> another one called Bakewise. And her comment is, is that when she did experiments on this sort of thing, in order for something to be thoroughly blended, she, it took 30 seconds of nonstop in a food processor for the baking powder to be completely incorporated in an, uh, evenly throughout the flour. So obviously, if you just give it a couple of whisks with your, a uh, couple of wipes with your whisk, you're not really going to be spreading everything out the way you should. So whenever I put my dry ingredients together, I put the flour down 
And then everything else, I sprinkle across the top, not just in, just, just dump it in, but sprinkle it across the top. So it's already starting to be mixed and really, really whisk for a long time. That's kind of a nice job to get, give to a kid who can do it for, uh, you know, for longer and, and uh, will, will be involved in the process. Don't add raisins and walnuts yet. You put the two, uh, you put the dry ingredients into the wet ingredients, that's usually the best way, and mix them until they're about halfway mixed. And then you add your nuts and the raisins and use a rubber spatula to con combine it the rest of the way. That way you don't overbeat the batter so that you will get kind of a tougher, chewier uh, sort of uh, bread. But at the same time, things are gonna be thoroughly incorporated. The rubber spatula makes sure that you reach all the way to the bottom of the bowl to get all of the flour out so that you're not leaving dry patches at the bottom and kind of throwing off your proportions. Now, I like to divide this into four uh, mini loaf pans. These four and a half by two and a half. But if you wanna put yours into a single loaf pan, either nine by five or eight and a half by four and a half, that will work too. And the recipe that I send you, that I will be sending you, will give you baking times for both of those. But I like these in smaller batches, uh, in part because the, the Kwanzaa table or any holiday table has got tons and tons of things to eat. And so little smaller slices are maybe a better choice and they look very pretty on a plate. You know, see they're kind of spread out there nicely and it doesn't feel like, again, a very large piece that's gonna to be too much to eat. And anytime we make multiple small loaves, we have that opportunity to share and I am all for that idea, obviously. I will recommend that anytime you're gonna serve uh, bread on a, a dinner table of any kind, get your butter out at least an hour, maybe even two hours out of the fridge ahead of time so that you can whip it up just a little bit, stir it neatly before you put it into its serving bowl so that it's easy to spread because there's nothing more frustrating than ripping a good piece of bread with cold butter. So kind of plan ahead and make sure that you're, you're ready to to send out uh, your best product, as it were. Uh, I, I once gave a talk uh, in which uh, there was a man there who became quite heated about how angry he is by the fact that uh, store-bought bread rips so easily and then the jelly drips through. So uh, uh, make sure that you're uh, making, your, making your guests happy with a, with a nice whipped butter. Anybody with a question about this, uh, this recipe or anything that has to do with batter breads in general? I noted the nuts were quite large. So is that, um, you know, what you were wanted to do as opposed to a smaller? Uh, that, I must confess that is a personal preference. Uh -huh. That I tend to like having nuts that are a little bit larger in a bread. Okay. Uh, now, I, I, I will say, however, that I know that there are people who prefer them smaller. And there is something to be said for a smaller, delicate crunch. But I kind of like a hearty crunch. I want to bite into something. Uh, and I, I like that. And if you toast your walnuts a little bit ahead of time, you put them in the oven at 350 for about seven to 10 minutes, th that brings out the flavor even more. And they are really, really good that way. That's a nice little trick to do. But you cannot walk away from that oven. I can tell you right now, you walk away from that oven, you'll burn. The, I have burned more nuts in an oven because I wasn't paying attention. Almonds, hundreds of dollars worth of almonds in my career have been wasted because I put them in the oven and walked away and didn't set a timer. So you want to keep an eye on them and be sure that you don't let them burn. But pecans too. The pecans are notorious, I think. Oh for that yeah. Too. Oh yeah. Pecans will burn if you just turn, you know, sneeze and blow your nose and then you turn back and everything's black. Right. Yeah. You okay. got to keep an eye on those. Especially. And they ain't cheap either. So. Oh, here's another one. Here's another question. Have you ever tried plumping the raisins for this uh, recipe? Um, I have not thought about doing that. I don't, uh, uh, although I will say I have made this with golden raisins that are already plumped or with baking raisins. They do make baking raisins uh, that are plump, that are kind of pre-plumped. Huh. Those are good in a batter bread like this. They are good in cookies. They are not meant to be put in raisin bread because if you need dough, if you need the dough with that kind of raisin, they turn into raisin paste and you don't really have individual raisins. I kind of like the way that these are kind of individual tight uh, and not too spread out. 
Uh, but yeah, some people do plump raisins, and I've, I've made it that way with a kind of a pre-plumped baking raisin or a golden raisin that might be a little bit softer. Um, but this is the one that I had here. Uh, that's what I had in the house and decided to use it. The recipe specifically says um, some people would put more raisins in than the proportion that I have put. You might see that there's not a whole lot of raisins in that particular piece. I think the reason for that from my standpoint is that if you put more raisins in, it becomes sweeter and you start to mask the delicacy of the other flavors. You, know, you get too much sweetness in a recipe and then you don't get the subtlety of the spices. You don't get the flavor of the, of the uh, sweet potatoes and all you're really tasting is sweet. And so this one is, is, is kind of backed off just a little bit on the amount of raisins. Okay. okay, another question. What about someone wanted to know about craisins? Using craisins. Um, yeah, you could certainly do craisins. I don't I think those are maybe a little too tart to go with the sweet potato, but you could certainly try that if that's a flavor profile that you would like. Now if I used craisins, I'd be more likely well, I don't know. I might consider if I use craisins, I might seriously consider using chopped uh, pecans instead, instead of the walnuts. Um I think that you could probably use dried Michigan cherries and use almonds, and that would be a good flavor profile. But again, I think that those flavors, because they're so tart, might mask the subtlety of the sweet potato. So you have to kind of give that a try and see if you like that or not. The raisins, I find just enough sweetness, a little bit of flavor, not so much though that it kind of overpowers other things. And someone else said, what about chopped dates? Oh, dates would be lovely on this, and that would be a little more traditional for for African flavor profile too. Raisins are not very common actually as a as a a food in Africa anyway, although certainly in the south uh, mm -hmm. of the United States, where the really sweet potato bread kind of has its origins. Uh, so yeah, dates would be a great choice. Now dates would definitely be go with pecans. Mm -hmm. For me, I would say dates, pecans, absolutely. That would be, it. and I have a I have a spiced pecan date bread for Christmas, actually, that you bake in a banaton. So that looks just lovely and it and makes the house smell like Christmas. Yeah, uh, so, uh, yeah if, you, if you're a date lover, then definitely, yeah, switch yeah. out that for the raisins. Okay, here's another one. Uh, would this bread be good to butter and then toast the slices so the butter melts nicely and the bread is a little crunchy? Yes, and uh, you know, I, I tend when I make this bread to make it just a little bit in advance such that it sits on the counter long enough so that the, that the crust gets a little crunchy, a little dried out. Like I don't wrap it in plastic so that it loses all the crunch on the sides. Uh, I think that's one of the nicest things about this bread actually, is it got that kind of, that, that caramelization texture on the outside where you get a little crunch to it. So yeah, a, a little toast would be, uh, toasting it in a toaster oven, not a a slice toaster. You might have trouble getting it out of a slice toaster, but a toaster oven would be just the way to go. Absolutely. Yeah, the bread is beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I, I it is. I, this is one of those pictures you want to reach in and grab one. Uh, mm -hmm. The last time, the last time I, I uh, or one of the previous times I've done this talk, somebody said, "So that is the one picture that as soon as I get, as soon as you were off the air, I had to immediately go and make toast of some kind." <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Right. Any other questions? This recipe can be made with gluten-free flour. Uh, if you're using a gluten-free flour that substitutes one-to-one, -one, like Bob's Red Mill one-to-one, -one. but I would increase the amount of orange juice and or applesauce because I feel as though uh, when you, you when you do these gluten free recipes, they tend to be a little drier, and they absorb the flour. I mean, they absor absorb the liquid a little differently than regular flour, and so I find a little extra liquid, and letting it sit in the bowl a little longer before you put it in the pan. Give it about a 15 minute sit in the bowl, all mixed up, and then put it in the pans or put it in the pans and set them on the counter for 15 minutes before you put it in the oven. So it just has a chance to absorb more of the liquid and then you don't have that kind of grainy quality that you can sometimes get with gluten-free products. But this will work as a gluten-free bread. I have a really nice recipe for gluten-free uh, 
pumpkin scones as well. So if you're someone who likes pumpkin pie flavors, I have a pumpkin scone recipe that's on my website and you can find by looking in the recipes page. All right, let's move on to our Christmas show pieces. Oh. Yeah, that's that's pretty much the biggest showstopper I ever make. That one is called a bolo rey. Actually, the dialect pronounces it buhe. Uh, it's a Portuguese bread, but we'll get to that. That's an epiphany bread. We'll get to that at the end of our little presentation. But let's look first at some of the things that you can make that kind of be the centerpiece of your uh, Christmas celebration. That could kind of the, the, the wow factor on the buffet table. Okay. Um, one of the nicest things I think you can put out on a breakfast table is this almond spiral. It has a wonderful flavor profile. It makes the kitchen smell amazing. Uh, of course, there is a problem if somebody has a nut allergy, but we'll talk about a substitute for that in just a little bit. So to make this, you take any basic white dough uh, that would be like for cinnamon rolls. Okay, so it'd be a little richer. You'd have an extra egg maybe in it, might have a little more butter, a little extra sugar in it, okay? And then you roll it out as if you're gonna make uh, cinnamon rolls. Now, I recommend that you use this Solo brand almond pie and pastry filling, or cake and pastry filling. It is simply the best almond filling out there. Uh, you can't use almond paste, you have to mix almond paste with other things to make this filling. This is all ready to go. And I actually will put the can in a little bit of warm water and warm it up a bit so it spreads a little bit more easily. But as you can see, it's simply rolling the dough out. And you know what? Please don't be too uptight about making it perfectly square because you see I didn't. Uh, <laughs> and then you roll it up as if you're making cinnamon rolls. But the next step is what makes the difference. And that is you cut it in half so you get a couple of half pipes. That's where this is a little bit different. So you've got these two half pipes filled with um, this wonderful almond filling. And the almond filling is very sticky. So the sides stay uh, together, it kind of glues all the layers together, it makes it way easier to work with than other, uh, other kinds of uh, applications. So I find almond is perfect for this thing, okay? So you make a spiral out of the first one, leaving it cut side up, and then you continue that spiral with the second piece of it, again, cut side up. You just kind of stick them together. You don't have to do anything fancy. You kind of wet the ends a little bit with a little bit of water or some milk, and they stick together just fine. The almond itself helps them stick, okay? This is a 16-inch pizza pan. So as you can see in the next one, it does spread out just a little bit. It's a beautiful, uh, color on the outside, and then I find I like it with this more lighter icing because it's very sweet. The filling is very, very sweet. So this lighter icing, but notice I have toasted the almonds that have gone on top because that's a much better flavor. And this is one. What, what I like about this is because it's this spiral thing. You kind of pick pieces off of it all day. You know, it's like you might cut a little bit and eat it at breakfast. It'd be a pretty, you know, pretty sizable cut. But that thing's still sitting on the counter. And as you're walking by, you know, I didn't have a little more of that. And there's not too many leftovers by the time you get to the 27th. So it's, uh, it's, a, nice, uh, it's a nice spread. It's a really lovely thing to put out on Christmas morning. You can make it the night before. Wrap it in aluminum foil after it's fully cooled. Uh, wrap it in aluminum foil. And then the next morning, pop it back in the oven at 350 for about 10 minutes and it will liven itself back up like it's freshly baked then put on your glaze and your and your almonds and you can serve it warm so it does freeze fairly well too but to freeze it you want to double wrap it okay so put it in two layers of plastic before you put it in a freezer and you can keep it uh, pretty nicely for at least a month uh, and i've had good i've had good results with that okay uh, here's where you, this has got a little more icing, a kind of heavier icing on it here, if that's the sort of thing that you like, more like a frosting sort of thing. But it can also be made as a cinnamon sugar thing with the, here's toasted pecans. If you have a nut allergy, you can just make it like it's a giant cinnamon roll and no one will complain, believe me. It's, a, it's just a delightful, and again, it's a very large, dramatic sort of thing, and you can tuck some greenery around it or some artificial flowers and make it look prettier. So 
Uh, I do really like this uh, recipe a lot, and uh, I make it fairly often. The, the brethren certainly like it. Uh, the almond, that uh, almond filling, that solo brand almond filling, you can find in the same aisle as the pie filling. Uh, sometimes it's on an upper or a lower shelf, but uh, you can find it in that same aisle pretty, pretty regularly. Okay. Any questions at this point? Okay, let's move on to chocolate babka. Uh, this uh, babka is a traditional um, bread that is served at uh, Christmas and Easter both uh, in Eastern European uh, countries. And it's usually made it in a fluted pan, like a bunt pan or a taller pan in Europe, actually. It's supposed to represent like the fluted petticoat of a, 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 of a Polish grandmother. Okay, hence the name babka. Okay, so it, it's that's what it's supposed to represent. Now you can make it in in one of two ways. One, you can spread your chocolate on thinner pieces of dough and roll it up so that those are enclosed like a jelly roll that you might make uh, cinnamon rolls out of. Or you can do the same process as we did before, where you roll a larger one and cut it in half. And what you're going to do is twist the two ropes together to get your babka cake. Uh, and look at all those layers. Oh, my Lord. Uh, it's one of my favorite things. And, and as you can see, it turns beautiful colors. It gets all glazed. The interior chocolate thing, you can make a chocolate spread from scratch with dark chocolate and cream and some other things. But you can also use the stuff that comes in a jar, that chocolate spread. Hazelnut spreads like Nutella will work. Jif, I hope they still make it. Jif makes a salted caramel chocolate spread that is just divine in this particular uh, application for this recipe. As a filling, it's just absolutely outstanding. Now, as you can see, you can also make it with uh, butter and, and brown sugar and cinnamon uh, and get a kind of a, a, a shiny beautiful cinnamon, giant cinnamon roll sort of thing. I, I, I did not know that the whole chocolate babka, cinnamon babka thing was, uh, was an actual uh, episode on Seinfeld. This was news to me. I, I just did these two things for uh, a talk I was giving, and then everyone told me about the Seinfeld episode. I didn't watch a whole lot of Seinfeld, so I didn't know I was tapping into some kind of cultural thing, uh, some sort of uh, part of, of pop culture. But as you can see here, you can also put a streusel on the top of it to bake uh, if you want that particular look as well. That is especially nice if you decide not to do the half pipe twist where you cut the roll in half, but you're doing two thinner rolls you twist together. Putting a little bit of the streusel on the top makes it rather pretty as well. The one on the left is served uh, with the top facing up that, uh, that faced up in the oven. The one on the right has been flipped over uh, so that uh, the, the streusel is there. Okay, so it's, it, it, there's a variety of ways in which you can do this. But, and there's a lot of babka recipes out there, but this gives you an idea of kind of ways that you can uh, make this particular bread. Um, I suppose you could use all sorts of other fillings. I imagine this would be really good with raspberry or something as well, but uh, chocolate and cinnamon seem to be the two traditional flavors. This is Hoska or Hushka. It's a lot of different variations on that name. It's uh, a Czechoslovakian bread. And uh, I really like it with candied pineapple. I'm not real fond of the kind of fruits that go into uh, fruitcake and the like. And that's a flavor that, that, that's a flavor profile that I just don't find enjoyable. And therefore, uh, I, I tend not to use that very often, but candied pineapple with this is really very delicious. It's always served as a braid, uh, and braided loaves are kind of traditional for these nicer holidays. I make a really beautiful ham and cheese braided thing for, for um, uh, Easter as well. That's got this braided uh, braided bread with a with a filling in it. It's quite quite lovely. Um, now, I want to talk about making braids. A lot of people have trouble making a braid because they can't roll the dough out perfectly even 
in straight rows and they're all exactly the same. So here's how to cheat on that. This is called a slab braid. Okay, and as far as I know, I invented this. I have never seen this anywhere else. I think I'm the only one who did it. Um, the first time I did it, I thought, did I make that up or did I see that somewhere? Because you know, you read enough books and watch enough PBS uh, or, or Food Network, you're like, I, I don't recall. I think this might be my own idea. You just basically roll the dough out with a rolling pin until you have a perfectly even oval. It could be taller, it could be fatter, it doesn't matter. And then you take an ordinary pizza cutter and you cut it until it's almost to the top. You leave about an inch connected and then take those strands and braid them just like you would make any other kind of braid. And you will get a beautiful braided loaf that looks like uh, it was made by a professional. I mean, people will be just amazed. One of those things about you made this. I mean, they'll be astonished. It really works very, very easily. You can practically pat it out with your hands. So um, I see that we have a couple of questions in chat. So I'd love to answer those if somebody has some. Yes. Okay. Uh, do you use citron as a flavor for the chopped pieces? You can. I, again, citron is not one of those things that I particularly care for. But if that's one of the, the flavors that you think of as kind of a traditional holiday bread, absolutely. You should feel free to use any of those things. A lot of people who make hoshka or hushka, uh, have kind of like their family favorites. Some people it's candy cherries, you know, the red and the green ones. For some people, it's more like the fruitcake fruit. For other people, it's orange rind, and they might even put a marmalade glaze over the top. So uh, th there's lots of variations on this, depending upon, you know, what your grandma made, basically, or what might have been available to them in their particular corner of the world. So uh, it, it tends to take on a lot of different forms. And there's another one, it's just a, a great idea on the braid. And I think, yes, I agree. That, that is a wonderful idea. Well, so. it, it helps so much. And a lot of people like, I want to make something pretty, but, you know, rolling those ropes out, it did take some practice. I mean, I started baking when I was in fifth grade. You know, I started, I made my first loaf, loaf of bread solo, you know, in fifth grade. And I've been rolling out dough into ropes ever since. So that's something that I've got, you know, plenty of practice in. But if you're just starting out, but you want to make something special, it's the holidays, you know, something special for Christmas or a gift for a neighbor who really needs something, you know, uh, who's feeling isolated because of the quarantine or, you know, maybe they've had some illness in the family. This is a great way to give them something special and show them a little extra love. Anybody else? That's all. Okay, excellent. Let's move on. Oh, I just want to show this. This is another kind of braid. It's called bambino bread. You can make it with any dough. And as you can see, it's supposed to look like baby Jesus wrapped in swaddling clothes. I, I hate to say it, but I kind of think you could put ears on it and get baby Yoda. But it's supposed to be baby Jesus. And so it's, it's called bambino bread. And it's a specific kind of braid made with a single strand. So you roll the dough out and you really tie it into a fairly simple knot and you get this bread. If you go on YouTube and you put in uh, the Bread Monk or you put in Breadhead Minutes, you will find a one minute video on how to make Bambino bread out of any bread dough you like. So it's just another Christmas bread that's something kind of pretty and different and unusual. And so uh, it, it's, just a, it's just a particular kind of braid made with the, the, the head coming out a little bit uh, more than usual. And uh, I think it really makes a, a pretty addition to a, to a dinner table. Uh, it's also a nice uh, bread to serve. Uh, you can make smaller ones uh, like little dinner rolls uh, or uh, to make for a uh, shower. Like you've got a baby shower and you want to make a little special dinner roll that you're going to maybe serve with ham salad or something. You can make these little tiny baby things. Uh, it's, it's just a charming thing to put out uh, for Christmas time. This is stolen. Now you see here I am using traditional fruitcake uh, fruits here, okay, uh, in addition to some dried cherries. Uh, stolen is a traditional German bread that is made as, um, it's supposed to represent baby Jesus in the swaddling clothes, that's why I put it after the Bambino bread. The idea is that the folded over shape is kind of uh, reminiscent of or suggests wrapping baby Jesus up in his swaddling clothes. And so uh, when one makes this, 
And there's two different versions. There's a yeasted version, which is more like pushka, almost identical to it in many ways. Or there's this version, which is like a biscuit dough, like a biscuit stone. The yeasted one takes three or four hours. This biscuit dough, you can be done in about an hour. So it's, it's kind of a nice uh, compromise uh, if you like, uh, if you want to make something traditional. A friend of mine who was German told me that when she was younger, uh, see this lady's passed on now, so it, this must have been somewhere in the you know, 1910, 1920s. Um, her mother uh, told her that uh, she wanted to help with making the stolen, and she said, I will let you fold the baby Jesus into uh, in his swaddling clothes. And she told her, her mother told her, lean down to the dough and whisper your hopes and prayers for the new year for the family and then wrap them up with the baby Jesus. And so that was her tradition was that the youngest member of the family always leaned down and said a little prayer and wrapped it up uh, to put it in the manger. And I just thought that was such a charming uh, tradition to do with one's children or grandchildren. Um, as you can see, this one has the traditional fruitcake fruits on the inside of it, and then also as a little bit of garnish on the outside. Uh, sometimes you'll see it made with raisins. You know, here's one where you want to plump the raisins for sure, by the way. Um, if you make this with raisins, it's more like what's called a Dresden stolen. So you put plumped raisins in there, and then you sprinkle the top with powdered sugar. That's kind of a traditional uh, serving uh, suggestion for biscuit stolen or this Dresden stolen. If you use raisins in particular, you want to put a little powdered sugar on the top to dress it up. Uh, you do actually brush a layer of butter on the top of the dough before you fold it over so that the layers stay a little bit separate. Uh, it really is very dramatic coming out of the oven, but you can make a lot of these at once. If you do the biscuit stolen, you can make a lot of these at once. You can make them fairly small. And again, a nice giveaway uh, sort of bread to share at Christmas time. And, go, and the little story that goes with it is charming as well. Okay, here's our bolo right. This is for Epiphany, you know, for the three kings. This is supposed to be the crown of the three kings. So you can see the cherries are like the jewels. Um, and uh, it's a very rich dough. It takes a whole stick of butter, and it's one of those breads that takes forever to rise. It's like two hours for the first rise and a full hour for the second rise. And you feel like it's not working. The kitchen's too cold, something like that. You really got to be patient with this. Um, this one, I made it a little too thick. And, and I, uh, I want to point that out to you that it would have been better if I'd made this a little larger. Okay. Uh, as you can see, you start with the dough. And on the inside of this, I have this one that has got um, dried apricots uh, as one of its as part of its flavor profile which I which is also on the glaze you can use again any kind of dried fruits you like candy cherries are nice as well you can see that there's some sliced almonds involved in this too now you flour your fingers as you can see on the left and push them all the way to the bottom of the dough and gradually start opening it up little by little until you get uh, a ring. And remembering that it is gonna double in size, so you might need to make it a little larger than you expect. They do make ring molds, stoneware ring molds, to make a perfectly round uh, bread. And that's really nice to make this in and any number of other breads in as, as well. Uh, you can also, this is kind of a nice thing, if you do have one of those ring molds, the stoneware ring molds, you can also cut this into two ounce sizes, uh, two ounce balls, roll them, you know, cut out two ounces and then roll it into balls and line them in a circle around in that ring mold. And then you'll get like a pull apart bread, uh, which also kind of gives it kind of a crown look as well. It's really, that's really quite lovely. Uh, as you can see, there it is on the left all dressed up. Uh, that glaze on the outside is made of apricot preserves and orange marmalade with a little bit of orange juice, a couple of tablespoons of orange juice, and then warmed up on the stove in a saucepan. And then, and just slightly warmed to make it slightly liquid, and then poured over the top. That's done on, on a parchment sheet or something. So you then transfer it to your serving uh, bowl, because it, it's a mess, it's a right mess. Uh, but uh, obviously it makes a beautiful presentation on your table. On the right is another kind of king cake, 
okay? Um, uh, the, and both of these, by the way, I think are superior to those garish purple, gold, and green things they sell at Mardi Gras. I find those just incomprehensible. Uh, it is traditional in both of these to put in a bean for the person who gets the bean in the king cake is the Lord, you know, kind of the Lord for the day. He gets to, to be in charge of the family for the day. Uh, or it's a good luck sort of thing as well. Uh, this one on the right, however, is a Spanish tradition rather than Portuguese, and the flavor profile of it, and I think there are probably some other uh, uh, Latinx countries that would have something like this. This is a sour cream pound cake, or it's a sour cream uh, coffee cake, that's flavored with orange juice and orange zest and dark chocolate, along with toasted almonds. And this, it, it is absolutely delicious. It's, it's called, a, it's an epiphany cake or a king cake, and I made it not long ago, uh, simply because I had some dark chocolate that was starting to go a little stale, you know, got a little bit of that bloom on it, and I thought, oh, I need to use this up, and I made one of these the other day, and I, I had forgotten just how exquisite it is, and it did not last 24 hours on the monastery table. Uh, so uh, that, you got the vote of confidence from them. That's a very easy cake to make in a bundt cake uh, form. And so I really recommend that recipe is also on my website. So you're going to get the link to my website. If you want to start checking things out right away, it's simply breadmonk.com. If you go there on the upper navigation bar, you will find uh, a word. It'll say recipes. You click on that. There'll be a drop down menu and you can find the recipes you're looking for. Click on them. It'll take you right there. So I, I saw there was one more question I think that needed to be asked. Perhaps not. Are there other questions that people have? That's the end. I'm going to stop sharing the screen here because that's the end of the PowerPoint. Is there anybody with a, a, a question of any kind with regard to holiday baking? Okay. Can you talk about the difference between all-purpose and bread flours? I sure can. Excellent question. Thank you. Okay. So all-purpose flour. Um, is made with a combination of hard and soft wheat, okay? And it's all purpose precisely because you can make cakes and cookies, which require a soft flour, or you can make yeast breads, which require a harder flour. Bread flour, and what makes the difference, I should say, is the amount of protein that is found in the flour, okay? And so bread flour is made with harder wheat grown in a um, colder environment, and therefore it has a higher protein, or it's been bred for a higher protein content, okay? Uh, and then uh, that is used especially for yeasted doughs. Now, you won't get a bad product, of like a horrible product, if you use a bread flour to make your, um, uh, to make your, say, batter bread, uh, it does kind of have a negative effect on cakes, I find. That's a little too much protein in a cake. Uh, but you're better off with a, you're better off with more like a cake flour and all-purpose flour for your cakes and cookies. Uh, but it's all about the amount of protein. It's the percentage of protein. All-purpose flour might have about nine to twelve percent. Uh, bread flour might have as much as fourteen or even sixteen percent. So it just depends upon the amount of flour uh, protein that's in the flour. The protein in the flour is precisely what gives the the dough structure. The, the protein molecule is stretchy. It wraps around itself and forms like a net, and it captures the carbon dioxide that is produced by the yeast, and that's what makes the dough rise, that stretchy kind of thing, okay? That's why you need the dough, is to develop your, your, your matrix of protein to capture it, okay? Um, and so those bread flours are for yeasted doughs in particular, okay? Let me check on the chat here. If solo bread fillings can't be found, how about canned pie fruit filling used? Any other substitutions? Um, you know, I have used uh, canned uh, pie fruit filling. However, it does have, uh, it, I recommend that you uh, run it through a food processor so you get a smoother product because those pie fillings, I mean, those uh, cake and pastry fillings are fairly smooth, okay? And you might even throw in a little bit of fresh fruit so it's not quite so liquid. Sometimes those, 
pie fillings are a little liquid. Is it worth getting cake flour for these special cakes? Um, I'm going to say no. There's only one application in which I say you really ought to get cake flour, and that you'll, you might be surprised to hear this. I think you should buy cake flour to make your Christmas cutout sugar cookies because I think you'll get a much better product. And I only say that because that's what my mama always did. And so I recommend it to everybody. My mom, and that recipe is online, by the way. You can find my mom's sugar cookie recipe. She always used almond extract instead of vanilla. She used cake flour instead of regular flour. And she used powdered sugar to roll the dough out instead of flour. So her cookies had this kind of thin layer of powdered sugar on them when they went into the oven, which gave them a slight shiny glaze in the oven and a, a little extra sweetness on the top. And you almost didn't need to frost them. You certainly didn't need to frost them heavily. Uh, and they have just the most exquisite flavor by themselves, especially cut into little tiny stars and served with Irish breakfast tea. Just saying, that's my, my serving recommendation. I have done that. Uh, I agree with you on that. Too. Yeah, oh, it makes all the difference in the world. Will your PowerPoint be available to view after this presentation? Uh, yes. It will be. Isn't that correct? We're going to put it on the website? On the right. Library on our, website. Archive, our archive programs. Yeah, Excellent. definitely. Excellent. Yes. Um, somebody asked earlier about uh, frozen dough. I got to admit, I don't freeze dough. I freeze finished products and then revive them in the oven before I serve them. I don't do frozen dough. There is a whole website page. If you go to breadworld.com, which is for Fleischner's yeast, um, they have a whole section on freezing dough, best practices for freezing dough. I think Food Network has one too. I just don't ever freeze dough. I tend to bake, do a big bake, and then freeze the finished product. And then I pull it out the night before and it warms up and then, the, you know, frost, defrosts. And then the next morning I pop it in the oven or I just put it out. Uh, like when I make basic sandwich bread that I'm going to put out for the monk's table, right? I've got a big commercial oven. I'm not going to fire that up for a single loaf of bread. I make six loaves of bread at a time. One of them goes on the table. One of them goes to a, a friend of mine that just really loves my bread. <laughs> he and his family, his kids love my bread. And then the rest of them go in the freezer. Okay. And I just pull them out as we need them. So that's my tendency is to go ahead and freeze products after they're baked. If you want to look at, about freezing dough, you're really going to have to look at somebody else's website to get advice on that. Okay. Um, can you make the dough and assemble the night before and then refrigerate overnight to bake fresh in the morning? Again, that is something that people do. And uh, there are websites that will describe you how to do that. Sometimes you'll have to change the amount of yeast to make that happen because sometimes you want a longer, slower rise with less yeast. Sometimes it'll overrise in the, in the refrigerator because, as I have said, even in the refrigerator, yeast and sugar have their love to keep them warm. And so they will continue <laughs> to multiply uh, even, even in the refrigerator. So do, do be careful with that. Uh, you might want to use a recipe that is specifically for refrigeration. I, I myself do not, again, I don't do that particular practice, in part because morning prayer is at 545. So I can't get up early enough to be able to do that. I would rather bake the bread, you know, put, you know stay, wait until it's cool, wrap it up, and then in the morning, before I go to morning prayer, pop it in the oven at a, you know, at a low temp, let's say, you know, 150, 200 degrees, wrapped in, wrapped in aluminum foil, and then pull it out warm and serve it that way, rather than trying to get up at 3 a.m. and, you know, defrost and then, you know, warm it up and bake it and cool it. That's a little too much for me. So I tend not to do that particular practice. There are recipes that are designed for that. Lots of overnight refrigerator rolls, uh, cinnamon rolls. There's a lot of recipes for refrigerator cinnamon rolls. And some of them are great. I, I just myself don't ever, don't ever use them just because of our monastery schedule being what it is. Morning prayer, breakfast immediately after. It's just easier for me to make things the night before. How about uh, uh, any suggestions to make your own almond paste or almond filling? Um, there is a, I don't know about almond paste. There's probably recipes online for almond paste. 
there are recipes online for almond filling as well, which tends to use uh, cornstarch to thicken it. It has a lot of sugar in it generally. Uh, but the, yeah, there's recipes online for that. I myself don't generally do that. I have done it maybe once or twice, uh, only because I wanted something. We didn't have it at the house. I wasn't going to go to the store. <laughs> you know how that happens. Uh, but when I that happened, I simply looked it up online and, and made it myself. Uh, I do like uh, the internet for that reason. But at the same time, I also own, you know, a huge number of cookbooks that have all sorts of those kinds of recipes in them. I'm a great found, great fondness for uh, uh, Fanny Farmer cookbooks and bake book. And then also, of course, The Joy of Cooking, I reference all the time. So those are the two I look at. Also, an old book you might want to look for that's worth owning is the Farm Journal Bread Book. Okay, it's no longer in print, but you can find copies of it all the time on, on Abe's books, and you find it on probably on eBay and other places like that. The Farm Journal Bread Book, and then the Farm Journal Pie Book is outstanding. And you definitely, if you want to get those in your collection, you like making pies, you definitely want to get those in your collection. Those are really, really worth having. Okay, any tricks for Santa Lucia butts? Oh my gosh, I haven't made them in years. Um, other than the fact that save your money for the saffron because it's thirteen dollars for a little tiny container, <laughs> and don't don't waste it on people who don't know any better. Um, but yeah, uh, the other thing about Santa Lucia buns is to be very careful that you not add too much flour to the dough and let it be a little bit soft. Uh, there's a tendency because you're going to shape them to want to make them the dough a little stiffer so it shapes easily, but then your your buns are a lot chewier which is not as good, okay? Your, 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 your finished product is, is a little chewy. And these are meant to be very soft. They're, they're like a little delicate pastry sort of thing. So for Santa Lucia buns, also I like, uh, Santa Lucia buns of course, very often have raisins as decoration. I like using those plumped raisins for them too because the dried ones can really dry out on the top. So using a plumped raisin for a Santa Lucia bun is probably a good idea. Uh, but yeah, those sure, are they're lovely, aren't they? And we just had St. Lucie's Day. Uh, but yeah, that's a, that's a great recipe. Um, your glazes look perfect. How do you make ones like that? Oh, thank you for asking that question. Here's the little trick. Okay, yes, there is a trick. Okay, this yes, is awesome. They're, they're okay. gorgeous, yeah. Here's, here's the deal. You, when, you mix your, um, when you mix your powdered sugar with whatever your liquid is, okay? Now, if you want something that's gonna be a little thinner, you, you can use water, okay? Uh, but I like it better to use cream or half and half. And let me tell you, those little packages, <laughs> those little packages of flavored half and half you get when you get coffee at Casey's, <laughs> <laughs> those make the best frosting in the world, okay? You can like make coffee mate? frosting, you can make vin French vanilla frosting, you can make almond joy frosting, okay? All those flavored things from, uh, that are half and half use that and then you don't even have to get out the vanilla you just use that as your liquid and it makes a wonderful delicious frosting lightly lightly flavored with whatever that flavor is the hazelnut is wonderful but mix it all together in a pyrex pitcher okay in a microwave safe pitcher and pop it in the microwave for 15 seconds and then stir it and then you let it cool to the point where you want a, a thin drizzle you pour it sooner because it's it's warmer and it will drip more. Or you let it cool a little bit longer and then it'll pour more slowly and then you can have like a thicker sauce. But that's the trick is to heat it up in the microwave first to the and it's just, so to get it to the pourable amount. The other thing that's good about that, people don't know this, powdered sugar has some cornstarch in it in order to make it be free flowing. And and sugar in general can taste kind of raw, but the cornstarch really does. So a little microwave action kind of gives that a little bit of a cook and you get a better flavor. Also, every time I make a glaze, a tiny pinch of salt, it makes it taste sweeter. Okay, but I mean really tiny. Don't overdo that or it'll be really noticeable. But a tiny pinch of salt with your frosting or glazes and, and, and you'll, you'll be amazed at the difference that makes. Try using those flavored uh, coffee, um, I, and I've used pumpkin spice before too. Pumpkin spice makes a nice little glaze on donuts, on spiced donuts. Uh, but you can use those flavored uh, half and half, or you can just use you know your your, your vanilla extract, almond extract, 
that sort of thing, along with your powdered sugar and milk. Uh, but that little heat up in the microwave really makes a big difference. Yeah. Anybody else with a question? Anything about baking in general, I'm happy to, to explore with you. I've got, you know. Do you use cardamom in your stolen? Um, not in my stolen. I tend, uh, cardamom is really more of a Scandinavian, uh, although some people do use it in stolen. I'm more likely to use cardamom in like a Swedish tea ring. Mm -hmm. uh, every once in a while, I'll even put it into um, um, limpa rye. I'll put a little bit of cardamom in with my uh, Swedish limpa rye, even though, especially limpa rye, I think is really good when it uses orange flavoring in addition to the rye. And a little cardamom with that, oh, kitchen is amazing. It makes the kitchen really smell exotic and lovely. Uh, I'm, I'm more likely to use cardamom in, in a, a cake than I am in a yeasted bread, too. Uh, you can use cardamom with an ordinary boxed cake and get great little tiny spice cakes that are, that are exquisite, just really delightful. So uh, mm. I tend to, when I make a box cake of some kind, I make a little treats for somebody. Uh, I, tend to, uh, I tend to throw in some cardamom or uh, some some uh, ground up uh, fennel seed or, or uh, ground up uh, cardamom, uh, not cardamom, um, rye. Uh, I can't, I'm drawing a complete blank on what goes in rye bread. Oh. Uh, caraway? Caraway, excuse me. <laughs> yeah, a little ground up caraway into a cake mix that gives it an amazing little spice flavor that's a, a nice little uh, thing to serve at tea or at the tail end of a light meal. Uh, mm -hmm. that's a, that was a tradition in Victorian times to add those kinds of things to cakes. And uh, in fact, if you, um, if you read in The Hobbit or in Jane Eyre or Victorian novels, you read about seed cakes, that's exactly what they are. They're basically an ordinary white or yellow cake mix. And you, you grind up, uh, you grind up uh, a little bit of fennel seed or uh, caraway or uh, cardamom and so forth and bake it that way. And it's like a little spice cake. They're really delicious. Little colored sugar on the top charming little thing to make for uh and i like to make them in the mini mini muffin pans and then you get a, a cute little little cake that you can put out uh, for a light tea it's a, it's a nice little snack you have one you can have them done in you know 25 minutes it's nice well i would encourage um uh, I, I noticed on your website do you have a new book out um i just last year i came out okay. with uh uh, it's called Baking Your Way Through the Holidays, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> okay. it is. It, many of the recipes you saw tonight are are, are in that book. Uh, uh, it's not all of them, but a lot of them you saw tonight are in that book, and with some ones as well. My mother's uh, cookie recipe is in there, and uh, of course the Epiphany cakes and so forth, but a lot of other ones. And uh, it is available on our monastery's uh, retail website. Uh, we have a rep website, it's monksmarket.com. Uh, you can write that down, or again, that will be on the uh, document, which I'll send to Madeline, and she can make available on the library website, so you can uh, find all the recipes that you need. But you can at least get started uh, by going to breadmonk.com, and a lot of the uh, information is already going to be there, along Here's with some, some yeah, other videos ahead. as well. I, I do have a full set of every step of baking yeast bread, from choosing your yeast and flour all the way to how to make croutons if you mess it up. Uh, and those are on my YouTube channel. Uh, they're called Breadhead Minutes. And you can uh, watch those and get a little mini tutorial on the steps of baking bread as well. Here's another one. What is the best oil to use when frying donuts? Oh, good. Oh, excellent question. Okay. So um, to be perfectly honest, the really best oil to use is peanut oil. Okay. Uh, which surprisingly doesn't have a peanut smell, but obviously there's an allergy issue. Uh, safflower works really, really well. Uh, some people don't like the flavor that comes with canola, but canola has a nice high smoke point, so that's good for frying as well. I don't recommend olive oil. I definitely don't recommend corn oil because that flavor will really come through. Uh, so kind of any, uh, any vegetable oil that doesn't have too much corn in it, uh, it is going to be fine. I, I've, I've used, uh, I've used um, a lot of different kinds of oils and, and, uh, 
and, and, and been successful with. The main thing is that they don't have a strong smell to them when they're frying because that can be taken on by the donut. So an ordinary canola oil will work just fine. Uh, and that's what I used actually. Well, no, I shouldn't say that. I have a commercial frying oil that we use in the school's um, kitchen, you know, in the school's uh, cafeteria. That's a commercial frying oil that's specifically for those higher temperatures and so forth. It has very little flavor to it. I don't even know what's in it, to be honest. Uh, that's what I, I usually use for mine, just because we get the big jugs of it. But I have successfully made donuts lots of times before with ordinary canola oil. And it, and it usually works just fine. Just try to stay away from corn oil or anything with a real strong flavor. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Father Dom. And I just recommend, go, go to his website. It's wonderful, breadmonk.com. There's just so much on there. You could spend a lot of hours. Well, you, so. you can get lost there a long time. There's, there's, uh, it's kind of like going on Pinterest for me. I had to make a rule for myself on Pinterest. I do have a Pinterest page too, by the way, and Facebook. I'm a 21st century monk, but I refuse to do Twitter. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, I do have a Facebook page and a, and a Pinterest page as well. Uh, do please like me on Facebook because you'll find out about these kinds of events there. I will very often post uh, them uh, in that space. And as a general rule, I, because my TV show started in St. Louis, that's where it was actually shot. I do a lot of things around St. Louis and Southern Illinois. Okay, so a lot of Missouri kinds of things and a lot of Southern Illinois things. So if you live in those areas, um, you, you please feel free to, to watch my website or watch my Facebook page because I'll post events that I'm doing when this COVID thing gets over with and I start doing live demos again. Uh, you'll be able to catch one of my classes at the Missouri Botanical Gardens or a lecture I might give at uh, the Missouri uh, uh, History Museum or at, uh, you know, a par a parishes have me come in and do presentations as well. So uh, keep your eyes open. And I might be in, in, a, in a parish or a, or a kitchen near you. So please feel free to join us. Oh, there's some really nice, thank you. I've been a fan since your PBS show. I have a few of your cookbooks okay. and this has been so helpful and interesting. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. I, let me tell you, because I can't go out and do live demos, I need this. Like seriously, I've been driven mad by not being able to share all this kind of stuff. Uh, the, the monks the monks are kind of laughing at me because it's like but you're baking a lot lately well yeah because like you know i, I gotta do it so yeah uh, uh my daughter did a great bake-off using your cookie oh how nice oh that's awesome that's awesome i'm really happy to hear that um i love it when i hear people say that you know there's a certain recipe that their family has to have that's the that one that i that they found on my website or in one of my cookbooks and it's it's, it's the christmas recipe it's the easter birthday, it's the birthday recipe whatever uh i'm always delighted when i hear that or you know my daughter my granddaughter my son was inspired by your show we were on right it's a lot of markets we were right after barney <laughs> so on, on Saturday we would be right after Barney so a lot of kids like they'd watch Barney and then they would see this little fat guy in the black robe uh, with the sneakers on and they would watch they would watch my show too uh, I did feel a little old I must admit when uh, somebody came up to me and I was at a food media conference uh, in St. Louis and somebody came up to me <laughs> Uh, who was obviously, uh, uh, you know, a, a young woman, but still, you know, was a food editor at a big newspaper. And she said, you were an important part of my childhood. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> Lord, I'm so old. <laughs> uh, but it was a delight to know that I, that I was an inspiration to her as well. So that was a yeah. good thing. I think I told you, Father Don, that my cousin, uh, that my ba family background is Croatian. And then this is Povetica season. Uh, for Christmas, so oh, oh. my yeah. family makes that for Easter, but it's a savory. Easter too, but especially it, Christmas. Yeah, in my family, it's not sweet; it's savory. It's made with bacon. Ah, oh, that, yeah, that's it's a made different... with bacon and chopped walnuts, not ground walnuts. There's not a there's no honey in it at all. It's made with six beaten eggs. It's like an egg McMuffin on steroids. That recipe is also online, by the way. Um, huh. That is, that's our tradition is a savory version of that. Used to be made with cracked ones, actually. Now you well, make my grandma did that, but it was an unleavened bread, but you still rolled it out. 
Um, oh, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, well, that my yeah. tradition, we called it Pavitsa. It's the more the Austrian version of it than, mm -hmm. than the Slovenian. But uh, oh, yeah, we've been making. But yeah, when we get the when we get the sweet honey ones, those are very nice. They're they're, they're quite lovely. Yeah. Uh, so I make your cinnamon rolls every Christmas morning. Thank you. I am not in Illinois or Missouri, so the virtual presentation is fantastic. I have to do more of these. I'm thinking we maybe need to do one for Valentine's Day. Oh, uh, I think I that's so wonderful. Lovely Valentine's recipes, and I just learned how you can make puff pastry in about 20 minutes. Oh, oh, we need to know this. How easy it was to make. It's called rough puff. It's not. It's not the fancier stuff with you know a thousand layers, but it, it's like a rough puff pastry. And I made these little bite things with a square of dark chocolate on the inside, and this wrapped in this rough puff, and they were exquisite easiest thing in the world. I thought little Valentine's Day bites would be a great little program. So maybe that's okay. in the future for, for the uh, Missouri River Regional Hospital. Okay. That sounds wonderful. <laughs> well, thank you so much again. Yes. And have a lovely holiday. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everybody. everyone. Happy baking. Good seeing everybody. Okay. Bye-bye.